them. Oh, reminds me. I'm sorry. I have to uh, go back because I need to make sure everybody is muted. All right, they are. Okay. Here we go. Second Peter, what a great book this is. First Peter is good too, but this chapter, I, I love this chapter. Okay. So it comes to Second Peter chapter one. There's some really, uh, really good tips here on how we can know we're growing in our faith. And Peter writes these as reminders. I'll talk about that at the end, why he keeps saying remind. Um, there's a, they've shown statistically that 95% of people forget the sermon the next day they listen to, maybe like, or maybe within the next week, they forget it. So sometimes we don't, we think, well, why do we need to keep hearing the same thing over and over? A lot of times Paul and Peter talk about reminders and a lot of times you know, God does that. I mean, he does that with the Old Testament too. When they came out of Egypt and he delivered them, he said, don't forget what I've done for you. Don't forget what I've done for you. And then they forgot, of course, and they fell into idolatry. So there's a tendency to forget over and over, no matter what happens. And God has to keep reminding us of things. So Peter sent this letter to some of this, obviously the same audience that was in the first letter. Um, some of them, you know, were Gentiles, so they were scattered throughout the regions of these areas here, um, different areas, but the regions, different regions here, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Um, and they also included Jews who believed, Jewish believers. Uh, but anyway, Peter most likely wrote this, they think, between like 67 and 68 AD, about a year after he wrote his first epistle. So... It's, it's the same audience as in his first, you know, first Peter. So now he wrote this because he was alarmed about the false teachers beginning to penetrate the early communities. If you notice, a lot of the letters in the New Testament, even Paul's letters, are dealing with false teachings or apostasy or, uh, you know, the warnings about false doctrine. I mean, there's such an, a problem that's going on very early in the early community you know, dealing with these things. It's just so prevalent. And Peter also is writing to this audience because there were there was some persecution going on too. He's writing to a persecuted community and he wanted them obviously to grow and become strong in their faith. He's encouraging them, but he's giving them some pointers here to talk about to, to they can remember how they know they're really in the faith and how what they can strive for, which will help them to have confidence in their faith, to help them to know I'm really a child of God. I'm really these, these things, when these things are evident in my life, I can be rest assured that I'm really a believer. Okay. And so a lot of chapter one has to this chapter has to do with sanctification, as we'll talk about. So Remember when they wrote these letters, just like Peter wrote it, they didn't know when Jesus was coming back. Jesus didn't tell them when he was coming back. They were with him. They spent time with him after his resurrection, and then he left. And they said, when are you going to return? And he says, not for you to know. So they they could write these things with the anticipation that he could return any time in their lifetime, right? I doubt any of them knew it would be 2,000 years later that we'd be sitting here talking about this. But that's just the way it works. So. Um, you know, Peter's writing this with the background of, you know, I was with Jesus, I spent time with him, I was one of his early disciples, and now I'm living with this kind of like eschatological framework, this apocalyptic framework that we're living in the end times. You know, they all thought they were living the end times then, in the last days, okay? So they didn't, like I said, they didn't know 2,000 years would still be we're still 2000 years later and still not sure when Jesus is going to come back. You know, we don't have a date, obviously. Some people try to set dates. It hasn't worked. So Peter writes this. He starts out, he says, for you know, Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have been granted a faith just as precious as ours. So 
he starts out with both these names, Peter and Simon. And I think we know that hopefully, you know, when Peter, before, you know, Jesus calls him the rock, you know, in, in Matthew 16, but, you know, Jesus, Simon is a very common name in, in Jewish quarters and Jewish families. Simon is a Greek form of the Hebrew Simeon, right? And so it's, you know, it's one of the father, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, a common Jewish name, right? And Peter is from that Greek word that means rock. Now, Peter's name in Aramaic is Cephas, right? And Paul refers to that in 1 Corinthians 15. Peter, he uses Peter's Aramaic name, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, that list of resurrection appearances. But Peter, uh, you know, he mentions both of his names, you know, both of these, right? And he probably did that because he wanted to make sure that people that are reading this letter just they he wanted them to know exactly who this is from no doubt about it this is coming from the, the same apostle who was the original disciple of jesus you know he's he's legitimate okay there's no confusion at all so but the one thing he says it's interesting is that he talks about back here where he says uh i'm sorry he says, from Simon Peter, Simeon Peter, a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, some of your translations say bond servant. Some of them just say servant, right? It says from Simon Peter, it might say a servant or bond servant. This translation I'm using says slave. Okay, now I know that that would be automatically conjures up, you know, might bring to mind some negativity, but, you know, you've got to read the Bible in context. Okay, you don't want to read... 16th century later things into the first century new testament okay this is there's a context of what he's doing here um but he identifies himself as a bond servant and that's where you get the word doulos from which i'll mention and actually i'll go i'll go ahead here skip ahead just a second doulos is a it's actually there's a book by john MacArthur. you can get it's called slave the hidden truth about your identity in christ he talks about the whole this whole translation of the word servant or bond servant or what slave is in the first century, what that means in that context. So if you want to go deeper, pick up John MacArthur's book. It's really old. I mean, it's not that old. It's maybe 15 years old. I read it a long time ago. But if you want to go deeper on that, he'll give you the whole context and the background of that. But um, when you think about Peter calling himself a bond servant, it obviously he's putting himself in submission and duty and obedience to Jesus. You know, Paul calls himself a bond servant as well in Romans 1, if you read Paul's letters. But it's this understanding that they are in submission or duty to Jesus, okay? And we know that if you're going to translate it as just servant, um, you know, there's plenty of people in the Old Testament that are considered servants, right? Servants of God. Many times they're called servants. God calls them his servants. It's the same same idea, but we're all bond servants of Jesus, okay? And technically, we're all doulosses or slaves of Jesus. Jesus is our master, okay? And when you look at that word doulos, what that word slave means in Greek, um, you know, it just means, you know, there's an old commentator named William Barclay, and what he says here, how to define it, First of all, it means the Christian belongs to God, for God to send him where he will and to do with him what he will. Uh, the Christian is a man who has no rights of his own, for all his rights are surrendered to God. To call the Christian the doulos of God means that the Christian owes an unquestioned obedience to God. And to call a Christian the doulos of God means that he must be constantly in service of God. So this is, you know, I understand that when I taught this once, people were freaking out in light of slavery in the history of the world. But that's, remember, there was Roman slavery at the time of Jesus. Okay, there's all kinds of Romans, Romans and slave people everywhere, right? There's all kinds of slavery going on then. Um, but, you know, the writers of the New Testament are contrasting that with being a servant of God or servant of Jesus, okay? Now, I understand that obviously people have used the uh they could take new testament passages and misread them and use them to abuse others certainly they could do that and that, that has happened um and i'm not happy about that but 
I'm just trying to get you to understand the first century context here of what, what Paul's doing here, okay? Because technically, we all are bond servants of Jesus. I mean, we belong to him. We really don't have any rights of our own, right? We surrender to him when we come to faith. Um, we're supposed to have an unquestioning obedience to God, and we're constantly in service to God. So technically, we all are bond servants to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we probably know that intellectually, maybe not practically, but that's the way the New Testament writers use that phrase there. Okay. But like I said, get John MacArthur's book right here called Slave if you want to learn more about that uh, in the, uh, the overall context in the New Testament. Now, Peter also calls himself not only bondservant, but an apostle. And apostle means sent one. And Peter obviously thought he was sent forth by Jesus. Just like you know, the sending theme is all throughout the Bible. The Father sends the Son. The Son sends the Spirit. The Spirit, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, sends the apostles into the world, sends us into the world. There's a sending pattern, right? And you, in order to be an apostle, you had to be a witness to the resurrected Jesus, okay? You don't qualify as an apostle unless you're a witness to the resurrected Jesus, okay? I don't really believe in modern-day apostles, um, just to say it. I know some people are not going to agree with me, but um, I don't know anybody. Unless you actually physically witness the resurrected Jesus, you're technically not an apostle, okay? Now, if you want to say, well, I'm sent by Jesus, I'm a missionary. I mean, I do missionary work. I don't call myself an apostle, but you know, if that's what you're referring to, I suppose you could use that, but I don't know why you have to use the title apostle. But anyway, so that's just my view on it. I think the apostle title um, went to the first century apostles. And I think that's over and out. Okay. And I don't really need it anyway. Why do you need it? Do you need to feel special? Do you, are you insecure about who you are? Um, you should know your identities in Jesus. That should be all you need, okay? All right. And so Peter, what he does uh, by, you know, using the phrase bondservant apostle, calling himself a bondservant apostle, he's presenting like a pattern of leadership here. He's got the submissive part as a bondservant, right? Like a sacrificial servant, Right. In submission to Jesus, but he's also got the authority of an apostle. Okay, so he's got the the humility, the the uh, submissiveness, and then the authority that's been given to him by Jesus. Okay. Then he said, "Okay, so let's uh, go on here." So once again, it says, "From Simeon Peter, a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who, through the righteousness of God our Savior Jesus Christ, been granted a faith just as precious as ours." So. He talks about here, then he says, talks about the righteousness that proceeds from the Father, but reaches us through Jesus. Now, if you look the way that's translated, you notice that uh, you notice that the Greek construction puts one article before the phrase God and Savior, which makes both terms refer to the same person. So what Peter's doing there, he's not saying god the father over here and god the son over here he's identifying jesus as both savior and god god and savior he's putting jesus saying jesus is both god and savior okay and so he's deity right but he's also savior of course peter does that as well in the book of acts or other places he takes old testament truths about god and applies them to jesus just like in the old testament god is savior right the jews know god is savior he saved them out of egypt and other places, but Jesus is now Savior and God, okay? So there's not like a separation between the two, okay? And then he goes on to say, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Uh, of His For his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Okay. So he uses two words there, grace and peace, okay? And, you know, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's that's pretty important, and Peter says he wants both of these things to be fully abundant in us, you know, he, uh, fully manifested in us, okay? And, of course, we could say grace is, we talk about it being God's free unmerited favor towards sinners, of course, that... We come to Jesus through his grace, right? And then 
the peace is really comes from God and it's it's with us no matter what's going on in our lives. It's supposed to be a peace that we have in the light of all circumstances, okay? Um, it's not always a feeling, but it's a an assurance we have, like an assurance that God is with us, right? And, you know, sometimes, you know, we're okay to, it's okay to feel anxious or troubled at times or concerned, but it's the issue of how we go through those circumstances and whether we remember that God has not abandoned us or forsaken us, right? He's with us. And we can call out to him for peace, of course. So this grace and peace will only be real in our lives through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. Notice it says, it doesn't say through faith. It says it comes to us through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. So knowledge comes from this sort of epinosis. And that's the main word. It, it actually is... Um, the word gnosis, you know, is tied in there. You know, we talk about um, knowing God or having gnosis, having knowledge, but epinosis is a um, a very rich kind of uh, thorough knowledge. It's an intimate knowledge, okay? It's not just purely uh, factual. I mean, it is factual, but it, it digs deep into your heart. It goes further than that, right? It's an intimate understanding of the of the subject, okay? Now, we don't really, you know, we're not going to get that knowledge. Oh, here, let me go ahead and say this next. I'm sorry. So the kind of knowledge of Paul, that Peter's talking about here that brings salvation and brings this is not necessarily from feelings, intuition, emotion, or personal experience, but only from the revealed truth based on the gospel preached and from the word. So this kind of knowledge that we're going to need that Peter's talking about comes from the word of God. It comes from an objective source, right? And so if you don't study the scriptures, you don't know God, you don't know Jesus, then you're not going to going to have that kind of knowledge, right? Um, so it's not just, you know, it's not just a feeling, it's just, you know, like a lot of people think, well, I don't, feel this kind of knowledge. No, the no knowledge is something you know, and you have to build your knowledge base. You build your knowledge base through studying the scriptures, of course, and this relational knowledge with God is built through that, this intimate understanding of God and Jesus through the scriptures. And then he says here, he says, for his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, called us by his own glory and excellence through these he's granted us precious and magnificent promises so by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world on account of lust now for this very reason applying all diligence in your faith supply moral knowledge your knowledge excellence and, and in your moral excellence knowledge okay he sure does mention knowledge a lot here a lot of a lot of things about knowledge again okay so when Peter talks about this divine power, he says his divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So you notice how, um, okay, when he says divine power, this is like a spiritual sufficiency that we have, and it comes from the power of God in us, right? And of course, that comes through the Holy Spirit. And it's the same divine power that rose Jesus from the dead. Okay, it's the, you know, you have the same spirit in you, the same power that actually rose Jesus from the dead. I know that can be hard to, to fathom sometimes, but Peter's saying that this divine power, look, he says, this divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. But then he goes on to say, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, when he says his divine power is granted, linguistically speaking, that's like a perfect passive participle, pars, participle, participle, which meaning that in the past has continued results in the present. So it had an impact in the past, but it has a current present day, res, you know, something's going on in the present right now. It has an impact in the present, okay? 
So this grant, this power is granted to you every day right now in your present life, right? Now, this is what I want to emphasize, something that's very interesting. So you notice at the beginning of this, he says, his divine power is granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So you would think that, you know, sometimes in the Christian life, we think we're missing something. We kind of think that we need something else on top of what we've received from Jesus. It's like, is there something, something I'm lacking to really be a vibrant Christian? Is there something that I need more? Do I need a second blessing? Do I need to go to a conference where I laugh in the spirit? Do I need another baptism, a second baptism? Is there a second baptism? Do I need another mystical experience? Do I need to have a new psychological insight or receive from esoteric knowledge? You know, do I need a private revelation that no one else has? Do I need a deeper, some like some deeper sense of my spiritual life that nobody else has? Do I need bindings of Satan in my life? Do I need like a, a heightened emotion or any of these things? You know, people throughout the Christian life have sought out all these things. Okay, they still do today. They go to look for, sometimes I call it the sizzle instead of taking the steak. And Peter says back here, he says his divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, through, but he says, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So, according to Peter, you have everything you need to be a Christian. God has given you everything you need, but it only comes through understanding who God is and who Jesus is, of course, says truth, says through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, and then understanding these magnificent, precious promises, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But the point is that it doesn't seem like Peter's saying that we lack something, okay? Because if you're going to seek out all these things all the time, you must think you're lacking something in your spiritual life. Okay, there's something that you need to, I don't know, be more complete with Christ or be more accepted by God. Maybe that's what it is. But Peter says we have everything we need. And so what he's doing is he's talking about our sanctification. And, you know, you think about, I'm going to skip ahead here for a second. You think about sanctification, let me go, sanctification comes from that word, uh, it means to make something holy, right, to separate things profane and dedicated to God, and sanctification is that work of God where he sets us apart. As soon as we come to faith in, in Jesus, and we're really born again, God sets us apart for holiness, right, to make us more like Jesus. We're all in the sanctification process right now as believers, everybody is. And, you know, we're justified before God, meaning that we're, we're in right position with God, meaning that when God sees us, he doesn't see our sin anymore. He sees us as identified with Christ, and Jesus has really paid our penalty in full, taken away our sin. From a legal perspective, if you do a courtroom sitting, you know, if we stood before God, we're free. We're not guilty anymore. And that's that's been accomplished permanently in us. But our sanctification is something that's continuous through this life. It's not perfected, um, but it's certainly that that's what God's doing in our life right now. He is definitely sanctifying us at this time. So when he goes back here, um, he's talking about sanctification. Peter's talking about these statements. He's saying Peter's saying that we have received from God everything we need right but for life and godliness and like i said sanctification is what we're all we're all in the process of sanctification that's where we're born again between now and when we go to be with jesus right we're in that middle phase and so you know that is something that you know we just need to remember but peter says we have everything we need which is sometimes we don't feel like we have everything but peter says we have everything we need despite how we feel Okay. Now he says this, he says, through these things, he's bestowed on us these precious and most magnificent promises. 
so that by means of what was promised, you may become partakers of the divine nature after escaping the worldly corruptions produced by evil desires. So then he talks about these precious and magnificent promises, okay, that we have received. And he wants them to understand this. Now, he doesn't list every single promise in both the Old and New Testaments about us, right? But there's an awful lot of promises that God has made to us. Um, they're precious. You know, Peter says they're precious and magnificent, meaning they're valuable and great, the greatest of respectively speaking. And we know that when we come to faith in Jesus, God adopts us into his family. That's a promise. We know he gives us new spiritual life. We know that he gives us grace. We know that he promises to never leave us or forsake us. We know that he promises to strengthen us, to guide us, to help us, to instruct us. Um, he promises that, uh, you know, we are his, his adopted children. He owns us now, really. He's our father. But there's, there are all kinds of promises to us. Okay, now Peter doesn't listen, but he's, you know, like I said, he said these things have been bestowed upon us, right? And then he talks about how we become... Uh, partaker then he says these these promises were promises so we may become partakers of the divine nature after escaping the worldly corruptions produced by evil desire and lust okay so he talks about this partaking of the divine nature so we definitely have a organic connection to god right he is he could truly be called our father and you ever notice in paul's letters he says especially in colossians I think it's Colossians chapter two. He talks about how they are in Christ. He says that several times. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. In other place, he says you're baptized into Christ. It's like we have this new identity. We're placed in him. In him, right? And so we have this organic connection for sure. And so um, when we talk about being partakers it's like being a share, right? Or a partner or, you know, it's fellowship with God. We become a sharer of his divine nature, right? The very life of God is in us. The Holy Spirit is the very life of God. And we get to partake of God's nature. You ever think about that for a second? Think about that. God, God, totally infinite being, totally a being not like any human of course totally different unique um perfectly holy has all these attributes omniscience om omnipresent uh all these things about god think about him and he allows you to partake of his divine nature now the nature of god or his essence we're talking about what god is like his nature like if i look at me uh, my nature is I'm a, I mean, my nature, my essence is I'm a body. I'm a, I have matter, right? I'm a, a material being. I also have a soul. I'm a body soul unit. That's my essence. Now God's essence his nature is he's Trinitarian. He's a, he's the father, the son, the spirit. He's one God, but his essence is Trinitarian. Now we can't fully comprehend that, right? God is not a physical thing we can see um the only one that took on an additional nature was jesus jesus added a human nature to himself the father did not do that and the holy spirit didn't do that but the point is that god allows us to participate or partake of his nature so you have the very presence of god living in you and that's just mind-boggling right and we can quench the holy spirit we can grieve the holy spirit we can obey the Holy Spirit, we can be led by the Holy Spirit, or we can just ignore him, and we can walk in the flesh, and we can live as carnal Christians, or else we can live as spirit-filled Christians where we yielded over to him, and he has his way with us, right, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 5. Just mind-boggling. Okay, now, when you look at pantheistic religions like other like eastern religions like buddhism hinduism those those other things they they all recognize they believe like the divine nature 
um, is in everybody, um, but they kind of lose themselves some way in the essence of the gods. It's it, every some religions have this kind of view, like some sort of divine spark or something, you know. Um, the Gnostics believed in some sort of secret esoteric knowledge that you can only participate in this divine knowledge for the special, the few who had that ability. They're very cultic, right? And so it's kind of like an esoteric knowledge. But a lot of these religions all emphasize attaining some kind of transcendent knowledge. Most religions do. Um, you know, trying to get people to attain something that's transcendent. And, you know, that just shows you that's God put his image on humans, you know, that we we strive to transcend our limitations as humans. We we long for transcendence, okay? The question is, are we reaching the right kind of transcendence and are we reaching the right God? But Peter is aware of these things when he writes this letter and he recognizes the need to be born again, of course. And the only way we receive the divine nature is to be born again of course we share in god's nature through the new birth supernaturally right as jesus talked about in john chapter three so we have this union now with christ right that's our core identity is our union with the lord that's who we are um image bearer of god union with jesus and you know our core identity when we get it in something else generally like uh a career or a person or a political party or a movement or a cause that generally throws us off and we get all bent out of shape when that thing gets taken away and that's why a lot of people are jumping on to causes because they need a purpose if you're going to go in a rally and just march all day for something you don't even understand never even done your homework to understand it shows that you're longing for some sort of purpose in your life some sort of cause you need an identity and so Jesus offers that, of course, through our union with him. Okay. Then he goes on to say here in Second Peter, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith excellence, to excellence, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly affection, to brotherly affection, and selfish love. For if these things are really yours and continually increasing, they will keep you from becoming ineffective and unproductive in your pursuit of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ more intimately. So now Peter is going to list these virtues, these virtues that we should strive for, okay? And I'll talk about each of these virtues here. Um, and, okay, I'm sorry, let me just move on here. Okay, let's talk about the virtues. So the first virtue, moral excellence, is... A distinct word in classical Greek for virtue. Um, it actually has a kind of the understanding behind that is some sort of moral, moral being like a moral hero, um, being like endowed by God to expel to excel in like a courageous way, which isn't bad. I mean, you know, we like to do that. I mean, we generally strive towards that. Um but we might want to think of it in terms of spiritual spiritual heroism. Just like Paul talks about, you know, he's pressing on for the goal of the upward call of God in Jesus, right? And so we um that's one of the virtues, the first virtue that Peter mentions here. But at the heart of this, he talks about it, the moral excellence is knowledge again. Okay, he talks about the importance of knowledge. And that is the foundation of discernment and wisdom. You can't apply what you don't know. And you don't, you're not going to be a person of wisdom because wisdom is the application of knowledge. So if you, you, you know, you can't, like I said, you can't apply what you don't know. Wisdom is taking the knowledge and applying it, right? So that moral excellence is tied into knowledge as well. Okay. Then he mentions the other, another virtue, self-control which literally means holding oneself in. Sometimes you want to think of the context like Paul has in 1 Corinthians 9, a very similar theme of, you know, athletes who sought self-discipline and self-restraint, right? They beat their bodies into submission. And 
I think that all of us know that you won't live a successful life as a Christian without self-control, whether it be self-control of your body, self-control of your tons, self-control over your time management, self-control over what you see, what you hear, what you do, just all kinds of things pertain to self-control, right? We have to be disciplined. Uh, you won't be, we don't live successful lives as Christians without discipline, spiritual disciplines, discipline in all areas of our life, right? And of course, you know, when you talk about self-control in that context, it could be pertaining to abstaining from rich foods, wine, sexual activity, you know, these athletes trying to train and get ready. So that's another virtue Peter talks about here. Then he's got perseverance, which is a kind of like a patience and endurance and doing what is right, resisting temptation, right, and endurance having endurance in the midst of trials and difficulties. I know that a lot of us learn this through suffering sometimes and through, through trials. There's, there's certainly perseverance that God builds into us and we have to persevere and go forward in our faith. And it's hard and it's can lead to tears and frustration and struggle, but that's what Peter, that's a virtue there. That's very um, important. And in some passages, it talks about, you know, persevering people in circumstances, persevering in hardship. Of course, Paul had hardships, we know. He talks about that. So that's another virtue Peter mentions here. And then he has another virtue, godliness, meaning reverence for God. Or it could also be translated as true religion or true worship. You know, basically somebody that honors and adores God. And godliness is just a way of life, right? It's the way we live. It's our attitude towards God. It's the way we think towards God. And Paul instructed Timothy. He said, you know, he said, it, godliness is profitable for all things as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. I think most of us can, as one pastor said once, you can, when somebody is spotting, looking for a spouse, they could say, that's, they can spot a godly man or godly woman a mile away. Um, I heard that sermon years ago. I think Charles Stanley said that. Bless his heart, he's gone now. But anyway, so godliness is a goal. So, I mean, that's a virtue that Peter is talking about as well. And then he talks about another virtue, brotherly kindness. And that, of course, is affection. Just like we have affection for God, we have affection for others. And we have devotion to our other brothers and sisters, right? It's love. And Jesus commands us to love each other. It's, you know, that agape love is a sacrificial love, right? Of course, we're supposed to show love towards everybody. But when we experience the love of God and know the love of God, it's going to make it a lot easier to share that love with others, right? But brotherly kindness has to do with, with our brothers and sisters, of course. So if we can't love our fellow believer, that's going to be a problem, right? Because that's that's really that's the mark of a believer to have love for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Okay. And so when Peter talks about these virtues, all these virtues he just men mentions here, we you know why is he doing this? What's the importance of these? Well, he if these virtues, he's saying, if you see these virtues in you and they're abundant, meaning that you're constantly seeing them increase in your life, or at least somewhat consistently increase, then you will not live an unfruitful life for the Lord, right? You know, useless life or, you know, being useless instead of useful, useless really indicates an active or idle, right? And that means where you're not in good service to God, sometimes means barren, right? That sometimes is used in connection with unbelief or apostasy. So, Peter's saying, if you manifest these qualities in your life, these virtues, it means that it's a mark that you should be secure in your faith. It's a mark that you're really a child of God. Now, I don't think he's saying we have to do these perfectly all the time. I don't think any of us do. But the point is that the direction of our life, we see these virtues in our lives. So, you know, we, if we're really believers, as I say here, real believers to whom God has granted us true saving knowledge, possess the capacity to pursue and fruitfully apply these virtues that I, that we just went over. 
So if these virtues, you know, are in our lives, then we will be enjoying the, the knowledge of God as well. The knowledge of God will be evident that we have the knowledge of God in us, right? And obviously, if we don't show any of these virtues, then we're kind of blind or short-sighted, like Peter talks about, okay? So probably, you know, you may be saying to yourself, well, this is kind of like the fruits of the Spirit. Um, there's a list, you know, in Galatians 5 about the fruits of the Spirit, but the list is a little different here. But, you know, these are some of the checkpoints as well, these virtues here. And then he says here, uh, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in the way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord, Je Savior, Jesus Christ, abundantly supplied to you. So he says here, be diligent in making certain about his calling upon you and his choosing you. Because if you practice these virtues, you'll never stumble, right? And you can have confidence about his calling upon you. Now, you know, we talk about calling and choosing. These are kind of inseparable realities about how God calls all people to salvation based on his election of them, which, you know, I don't have time to go into all the debates about what election is and whether Jesus died for some or he died for all in Calvinism because I don't think any of the New Testament authors read Calvin or Arminianism, so they don't they don't know any of those people. So I just kind of like to read the Bible, okay, and stick with what the Bible says. So if you want to have those debates, that's a debate for another time. But it's not something that it's a big thing on my mind. Um, but the point is that Peter wants them to have confidence and assurance that they are elected of God. You know, Israel, God called elected Israel. We said that God elected Israel to be a light to the nations. He elected them to spread the knowledge of him across the world. He elected them to show the one true God to the nations around him. He elected them out of grace. There wasn't anything special about them, but God elected them, right? And God elects us to be his children. And he wants us to have the confidence that we're really in a relationship with him, that we're really his. And when we practice these virtues, as Peter talks about here, that's one of the signs, and that's that's one of the things that gives us confidence to know that we are really, really part of God's, uh, you know, we are his children, okay? There are some things that we can see that really point to that, right? So Peter wants them to have this, and God wants us to have it too. So the practice is a pattern of daily conduct. And this practice that Peter's talking about is keeping with these moral vir virtues that he describes, right? And that will lead, lead to a productive spiritual life. So this is like a walk, you know, before God, a walk before the Lord, a sanctification. And then he says, oh, yeah, you notice how Peter says, therefore, I remind you in verse 12. He talks about, therefore, I intend to remind you constantly of these things, even though you know them are well established in truth, you now have. He uses that word remind. And then he says the same thing in chapter three, verse one. He says, this is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of a reminder. See, he's he's trying to remind. Them. And like I said, God has a way of saying that through the Old Testament too, to Israel. He talks about helping talking to them about not forgetting right what the, he did for them paul says the same thing he says finally my brethren rejoice in the lord to write the same things again is no trouble to me as a safeguard for you so and sometimes you know you may hear the same sermon let's say you hear the sermon about something you're kind of like oh i've heard about this before i don't need to hear this I don't think I've ever heard one sermon that I've actually listened to all the way through. I'm talking about that I cared about. Obviously, I had to be engaged with it, whether it be live in person or else on the radio or podcast. But I don't think I've ever heard one sermon I did not receive something from the Lord through it, meaning that he said something through that sermon. So you may hear the same thing over and over. It may be a reminder, but the reason we need to be reminded is because we forget. 
and God may have to say something over and over to us. And that's, that's really important. So just remember, don't take it lightly when, when the Bible talks about reminding, you know, Peter's reminding them, right? And then he goes on to say here, he says, we did not follow cleverly con concocted fables when we were made known, we may know to you the power and return of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, we are eyewitnesses of his, actually better translation is majesty. Uh, for he received honor and glory from God the Father. The, the voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory. This is my dear son whom I am delighted or well pleased. When this voice is conveyed from heaven, we ourselves heard it. For we were with him on the holy mount. So there, here Peter goes back to the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17. But he makes it clear that this is not something that is fiction. Okay, we were eyewitnesses. We were there. We saw the entire thing. And so he knew that there were false teachers at that time and also false apostles. And they obviously were probably speaking against the true apostles, saying that they were false apostles. And Peter's contrasting that, saying, no, 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 we, we are true apostles because we're eyewitnesses to the resurrected Christ and we're, we were there. And he talks about this thing about clearly devise, you know, it stems from that phrase to make wise. And so, you know, it refers to anything deceitful. And then he talks about the fables or the, the tales, you know, and that, you know, sometimes is directly related to where we get that English word myth from, because there are obviously myth, mythic stories of like gods at the time and heroic figures, right? There's, there's little stories going on there in tales, but Peter's aware of that. Um, but Peter is really trying to hammer home that, no, this is a factual thing that happened. We were actually eyewitnesses. We saw the whole thing. Okay, we were there. You notice how if you read the book of Acts, they say several times about being eyewitnesses over and over. You know, they say it all throughout the book of Acts. Now, in the Old Testament, something in Deuteronomy 19, it says that everything has to be confirmed by two or more witnesses. A claim or something has to be verified by two or more witnesses. So remember, the Jews were aware of this. Peter and the, the rest of the Jewish apostles were aware that an individual witness, one witness wasn't good enough. They needed multiple eyewitnesses. And they do have that in the New Testament. They have multiple eyewitnesses to the resurrected uh, Jesus. But Peter is definitely trying to contrast that. And so remember, you know something happened in history through three ways. You have written documents, you have eyewitness testimony, and you have archaeological evidence. Generally, those are the three things people look to. What are the documents we have? What witnesses do we have? Were the witnesses telling the truth? How do we know the witnesses told the truth? Well, if they lied about it, they'd have to have a motive. And if they had a, if if they lied about it, the motive would generally most motives for lying come from the desire for sex, money, or power. That's what history shows. Most people lie for money, they'll lie for sexual gain, and they'll lie for some sort of power. So you'd have to ask yourself if the New Testament authors were motivated to lie, did they do that? Did they is there any evidence they lied for money, sex, and power? They didn't get any power. All they got was persecution. They didn't get any money. They were pretty much on the foot all the time. And they didn't really talk about any major money thing, that, any kind of money handout or money payment, right? And they didn't get any sexual gain because if you read the New Testament, it talks a lot against sexual immorality. If anything, it says, talks more about purity than any kind of sexual gain. So there's no motive to lie. Okay, so yeah, you can be a witness to anything. There can be eyewitnesses. You want to ask yourself, are they credible? Do they tell the truth? And what kind of tests can you run on their character? We can't interview the apostles today. We can't interview a lot of people in the past. They're gone. Okay, we have to trust their testimony when they wrote it down that they're telling the truth. And like I said, if Peter and the other apostles we're not telling the truth. There have to be a motive for that. There has to be a motive for fabricating things. 
And there's really no motive for them because they don't receive any money, sex, or power. Okay. They didn't, you know, there was no big giant church building where they took over and said, follow me and you're going to, I'm going to be your leader and you have to do exactly what I say, like a cult. Um, that really wasn't going on. Now, of course, you have the Catholic Church that comes along four centuries later. That is a giant, powerful entity, but that's much later on. Okay. All right. And then he also talks about um, this passage in Second Peter, which we only really have a couple passages in the New Testament about inspiration, like the inspiration of Scripture. Of course, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, where he talks about all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, etc. And then Peter writes in 2 Peter, he says, knowing this, and no prophecy of scripture is of private interpretation. No prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men spoke from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. And so moved there means like born along. Now, as I said before, we don't really know how the process of inspiration works. There's no, it's very hard to nail down what that looks like. Like when God is leading them by the Holy spirit to write scripture, like, um, you know, I think some people think God dictated it to them, like out of the sky, like he just emptied their minds and kind of gave them like a typewriter effect, you know, like they're just typing it down, like their hand, you know, that's not, that's not really what inspiration is in the scripture. God uses, there's a human element and there's a divine element. And there's a meeting point between those two. Now, we don't know how that works because we don't know what that looks like. We just know that God definitely influenced the writers of the New Testament. Did he, you know, did he enter their minds? Did he, he obviously used their human humanity and their culture and their background because there's too much stuff in the New Testament, different writing personalities, cultural background, things like that. But I don't really think that we want to hold to the same view Muslims have of the Quran, where they think the Quran is dictated out of the sky from Allah to the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. Muhammad couldn't read or write, but then he did, he told others around him what was dictated to him, and then they wrote it down. But there's no real human element i mean it's it's really more of a dictation effect and so that's not really what we believe about inspiration god definitely inspired the bible and he moved upon these men to write it and he worked with their personalities um, but we don't know exactly how inspiration works i i don't seen any good explanation for 25 years exactly how it works it works it's there but we don't know how how the human element and the, the God come together, how that works, okay? Is it 50% God, 50% man? Is it 90% God, 10% man? I don't know. But all you know is you see the human element in the writings, and you see God's spirit involved as well, okay? So that's all we know. All right. So that's about all I have for Second Timothy. I hope that, or Second Peter, I hope that we can um, think about some of these things as we, think about our sanctification and try to strive to manifest some of these virtues in our lives. Um, but the one thing I want to hammer home again, just before we wrap up was the part I talked about, uh, about sanctification that we do not lack anything. Okay. God gave us everything we need to live the Christian life. Now, the, the problem is there's a gap between what we know and how we act. There's a gap between how we apply it. Okay, so yes, that is true that we can know this stuff and say, okay, yeah, I know God's given us everything we need, but I'm not experiencing that. So there's a gap between, you know, how we know it and how we apply it. And that's where the challenge comes in our application, right? But we can't say that we're missing something. Okay, there's nothing we are lacking. God's given us everything we need. All righty. So I will stop there.